The process of urine formation is actually accomplished through three processes, glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption, and tubular secretion. And it's not like two has to happen after three. So tubular reabsorption and secretion are happening simultaneously. This slide is just a summary of the different steps of urine formation. We know that during glomerular filtration, the blood plasma is going to be filtered, forming filtrate. Tubular reabsorption is kind of new for us. With tubular reabsorption, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking substances out of the tubular fluid and bringing it back into the blood by having them cross the epithelial cells that make up the wall of the renal tubule. You can kind of think of this as saving any of the good stuff that might have entered the filtrate, such as glucose. And it's not always just saving good stuff. Sometimes we actually save bad stuff because it's going to help us to do something else in the kidney. Tubular secretion is the exact opposite. We are going to be taking stuff out of the blood and putting it into the tubular fluid by crossing those epithelial cells that make up the wall of the renal tubule. You can kind of think of this as like a last chance to get rid of any bad things that are in the blood that didn't make their way into the filtrate, like drugs or acids. And again, it isn't always just to get rid of bad stuff. Sometimes we will secrete something, again, because it will help us to do something else in the kidney. The process of glomerular filtration requires substances to move past the fenestrations of the glomerulus and through the filtration slits of the podocytes into the capsular space becoming filtrate. What is infiltrate? Go ahead and pause the video and see if you can name, let's try six different things that you might find in filtrate. When you're ready, hit play, and let's see if you got them right, what sorts of things you picked. Okay, so what's infiltrate? Water, nitrogenous waste from metabolizing proteins, so this could be like urea, ammonia, uric acid. We will have electrolytes infiltrate, like sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium. We can have stuff in there like amino acids and glucose, which are nutrients. We can have bicarbonate. We can have acids. We can have drugs in there. So there's a lot of different things that could be infiltrate. What's not going to be infiltrate, what makes filtrate different than blood, is filtrate has no cells and typically no proteins. If there's a lot of proteins in filtrate, that means our, our glomerulus is broken. Glomerular filtration is driven mostly by blood pressure. Basically, your blood pressure is what causes the process of glomerular filtration to occur. Filtration pressure is the word we use to describe the amount of pressure that's being used to force the substances out of the glomerulus into the capsular space. Filtration pressure increases if blood pressure in the glomerulus increases. And the opposite is true. If your blood pressure drops, then the filtration pressure in your glomerulus will also drop. Blood pressure can also be called blood hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic just means fluid. So this is talking about the fluid pressure that blood exerts as it's pushing on the walls of your blood vessels. Typically, we talk about arteries specifically. So just think about a garden hose, right? As the water is flowing through a garden hose, that water is pushing on the walls of the garden hose. And we know that's true because if you poked a hole in your garden hole, we know the water would come squirting out because it's pressing on there, right? So the blood hydrostatic pressure is the pressure of the blood pressing on the walls of the blood vessel. There is hydrostatic pressure in the filtrate because it is a fluid and fluids have hydrostatic pressure. But the hydrostatic pressure of the filtrate is much lower than the blood hydrostatic pressure. So substances are going to be forced to leave the blood moving in the filtrate rather than substances moving from the filtrate going into the blood. It's also worth mentioning that there is an osmotic pressure that's occurring here. So I don't have this typed up on the slide, but there is an osmotic pressure that's taking place, or actually two osmotic pressures because the fluid in the glomerulus and the fluid in the filtrate are not pure water, they do have substances inside of them that can act as osmotic agents drawing water towards them. So inside the glomerulus, there's a lot of protein. And the protein 
acts as an osmotic agent. Just like when we talked about capillary exchange, remember how albumin would draw water into the capillary on the venule side? Well, there's still albumin inside this capillary and it's drawing some of the water out of the filtrate back into the glomerulus, but not a lot. The blood pressure is still much higher than that osmotic pressure. So we still have fluid leaving the glomerulus entering into the capsular space. There is no protein in the filtrate, but there are other substances like sodium, for example, that can act as an osmotic agent. And so these osmotic agents are also going to be drawing water towards the filtrate. But I'm not going to ask you about these osmotic agents because really, like I said, ultimately it's blood pressure that is determining the process of glomerular filtration. Now I will say that if there are huge problems with proteins in the blood, then that can affect the process of glomerular filtration. For example, if there's way too much protein in the blood, then that might actually make it so that the osmotic pressure drawing fluids into the glomerulus is higher than the blood pressure, in which case no filtration will occur. And that's one of the reasons why it's bad to have a high protein or just high osmolarity within the glomerulus.